So good evening, everyone. It's quite impressive. You nearly made it. Change of venue four hours before the event. And an event taking place after three years. So welcome, everyone, to this Pechakcha, Pechakcha, Pechakcha. You know what's the meaning of Pechakcha? In Japanese, Pechakcha means blah, blah. Chit chat, the sound of the conversation. And so tonight, we are having our 66th Pechakcha night in Brussels. There are more than 1,300 cities on the planet doing Pechakcha night. And we have a super lineup of speakers. And we will spend jumping 400 seconds by 400 seconds. So the setup is quite simple. 20 images, 20 seconds per image. Everything is set in a machine. Speaker can't do anything. Just keep you under traction. Fantastic storytellers, super stories. And then you'll spend a nice moment networking. Everything will be in English in this Pechakcha. We have done some in French, some in Dutch, mixing languages. But because we are in partnership with the CPDP, a conference hosted here and at the Al, English will be our Frinka Langua. So my name is Alok Nandi, and I have founded Pechakcha in 2007 in Brussels. But Pechakcha was born in Tokyo in 2003. So in Brussels, we had more than 1,000 speakers. And you are speakers number 1,021, 22, 23, 24. And then we'll see the magic. The magic of Pechakcha. And uh, is Tabea there? Not yet. So Tabea is uh, on the organizing part. And uh, she's helping us coordinate everything. So she's CPDP. Coming one minute ago. OK, super. <laughs> tell, tell to Tabea that we are waiting for her. So that uh, we are going to have a, a kind of special moment. We are going to have three moments here. We'll have what I'll call the moment zero with a special speaker. He came from Berlin, and he will spend 400 seconds with us, but breaking the rules. <laughs> and then we will have nine Pechakcha speakers. Each of them will have 400 seconds, 20 images by 20 seconds. And then we will have a drink and a networking moment, which is uh, provided to us by CPDP and a famous browser organization. I don't know if some of you know Mozilla. So Mozilla is one of the sponsors, and they are going to invite us. And, uh, so this is the evening. Feel free to uh, enjoy the stories, and then to network, try to speak to everyone in the room. We are quite a small group. There are four or five things happening at the same time. I know some people who could not make it because they are taken. But we have 10 storytellers, one performer, nine storytellers. And storyteller number 11 could not make it because sad for him, but he's recovering. He got COVID. So be careful, COVID is still uh, somewhere in the system. So in place of 11 speakers, we are going to have 10 speakers. Speaker number zero is getting ready, and then we'll have nine speakers. Why speaker number zero? Mohsen. Mohsen is based in Berlin. He's coming from uh, Iran. And uh, he's going to bring us into a non pechakucha format hard negotiator, I said yes. <laughs> he made it. And he's going to bring us in a journey in 400 seconds. And that journey will be partly digital, happening on screen, and partly physical with our storyteller. You know, he's coming from Iran. And Iran has one of the most fascinating storytellers of the planet, if we go back 3,000, 2,000, 1,000 years ago with fantastic poets. So, Mohsen, bring us where you want to bring. Thank you. Welcome, Mohsen. Thank 
you will not get angry. <laughs> you need uh, this microphone. Oh, you can Marie, is, it working? Oh, yeah. is the audio OK? Uh, Marine, can you hear us in terms of audio? Yep. Yeah, it should be fine, yeah? Yeah. OK, so yeah. So I mean, this is a PowerPoint show. Yeah. You know, Pechakcha is <laughs> killed the PowerPoint because we hate PowerPoint. <laughs> and here, Mohsen is bringing us back PowerPoint. Yeah. I, I didn't mean, expect that. He's hacking my brain. Yeah. I mean, I hope you will not get angry <laughs> during this. <laughs> Maybe you want to stay. I guess. You want, you want no, I'm to stay far away. Far. <laughs> but you can throw some. OK, so yeah, a slide number zero. I mean, it's like literally a slide. But I mean, what about if this is like, like start rotating around, like getting it like 3D shape? Or even what if like this slide can do some interactions with us, like bring this microphone into it? Or maybe we can like kind of unfold this slide, like to some different <laughs> parts. Okay, so I mean that was the the first like I mean let's say uh, you know like this it's a kind of like a journey in three D space. So I was trying to like at the beginning I stick to this like a slide system, but the rest is like something like between time and space. Like it's like a real time presentation, and I mean it could be contain everything, including also a slide. So. What you see here is like <clears throat> what I made like based on a project that I did, like RTTT, Render True True Texture. So it was about, oh, something I forgot. I mean, there is a zero here, so, okay, so that's a counter. I should have stick to this 400. We, we, we will not count the first slide, <laughs> but, okay, so this like, uh, this is like a part of like this RTTTT projects uh, that it's about like mirror and reflection and it's, it's impact in uh, kind of like our literature. So I was trying to play around like render to texture kind of technique in real time applications and then simulated in this uh, 3D virtual space. And the idea of this like virtual space was like during the pandemic time, uh, I mean, there were like, a lot of like events, some like online events. And I started working on like a pr uh, presentation, but itself as a project of mine. So, so I mean, what you see here is like a journey that I started during this pandemic. Like for example, what you see here is that like the, the, lock, the place that I've been locked down in Barcelona during that time, I did a 3D scan. And then I, I made this path kind of and then any time that I'm doing a project or doing a research or working on a project, then I kind of like add something to, the, to this path. So at the same time, like this kind of like this presentation is like something ongoing for me. So we're going through like, I mean, some of the projects that I did that I'm doing, but at the same time in the like umbrella of this kind of like presentation. So what you see here, like this car uh, is like, I mean, I wanted to talk about like this uh, fall project that I'm working on for a couple of years. It's about like fortune telling. We have a, we have a kind of like a fortune telling method method in Iran by Hafiz Poetries, and I'm trying to use like AI to kind of uh, uh, bring this poetry or like uh, you know like the the main concept of this. Uh, Fortune telling is you open a random page of this book and then start like interpreting something about future or, uh, or about the question that you had. But what I'm doing is like, uh, what I'm doing is to like, I, I feed this AI system, which I call like, uh, I'm feeding this AI system to, I'm feeding this uh, poetry to this AI system and as uh, like, and generate some sentences based on, uh, like uh, ser internet search and like this kind of stuff. And then, yeah, this guy is like, a, is a part of a short film that I made. Maybe, I mean, I can play like uh, a little bit of this film. Like it's like a really short teaser of this film that I made. It's about like, I mean, the, the film name is like Redundancy Repetition is also based on some like 
metaphoric uh, symbols in Iranian literature I was inspired by. It's like, it's like a journey, but it's also connected to the meaning of like letters or like genitive cases in, in letters, which like, I mean, I don't want to make it like too long, but it's about like how genitive cases connected different letters, different words to each other in terms of like talking about one something unique at the end. So that was the main concept of this project. So this again, like uh, this is like uh, how this like fortune telling is working. So I mean, each of these like 3D models we can consider as a slide. I mean, don't get angry. <laughs> I mean, I'm just like rotating around these slides at the end. And then like, yeah, I mean, again, like, sorry, I'm jumping between projects. Uh, again, like for the fortune telling project, like. They, I, I always use fish as a symbol uh, on this project. And then like all these visuals that you see is like something that I kind of like made for this presentation to talk about the project that I was working on. So that's why I say like this, this presentation is already a kind of like a project that I'm working on. So yeah, again, like, I mean, this is like a metaphoric uh, kind of like visual aspect of how this uh, AI system go through internet and look for some, some data and collect them and then sort them based on this like fortune telling. It's about like AI, but with a like a spiritual uh, kind of like approach, let's say. And then <clears throat> for this project, I, I start making I'm making uh, this like this kind of fight between like this demon and this like uh, character that is like representing Hafez, which is a poet from Iran. And this demon, in my opinion, was like uh, something like a, uh, like using AI in like non-spiritual ways. So I mean, the main purpose of this project is like about like leave AI to like go through like this internet and these poetries to bring some uh, spiritual data for us. Kind of, and I also named this project Bihush Masnui. It's like a Farsi name. Hush Masnui means like literally artificial intelligence, but B is like non. It's something like non-artificial int or like non-intelligence, something like that. I mean, something like roughly like that. But I mean, this Bihush is also in Iranian literature is using by uh, for some someone drunk, uh, and in a like a spiritual uh, term. And I made this creature as a like a AR sculpture like a year ago with a commission by a museum in Sweden, and it's like a, it's, in, it's inspired by a, a phoenix, also like some stories in Iranian literature. But I mean the like the really rough story about this project is that it's an AR interactive project that everyone can leave a message in this project, and then by each message this. Uh, this creature get um, get more feeders. So like by people like sending message to the project, uh, this this creature gets bigger and bigger. Sorry, it seems like I did a like mistake in like uh, this timer system. I should correct it. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. I think like I I keep pressing some. But how is the time situation? Everybody is fascinated. It's already 800 seconds. Really? <laughs> so good. Should I close the laptop? <laughs> I mean, just quickly. Yeah. Or no? <laughs> Sh shall we ask to the audience? Are, are you still with us? Sorry. <laughs> I mean, to be honest, this like uh, this uh, timer implementation is what I did to today after 12 hours travel in bus in a cafe in metro station. <laughs> so I, I should do it more carefully next time. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, uh, this project like roughly is about like. <laughs> 2,000 years ago, I mean, there is a, like some object found in Iran like from 2,000 years ago and they like considered as a battery that works with wine actually. And it actually works. And they call it Baghdad battery. I kind of simulate this battery with like 100 milliliters of wine and I generate electricity and lit this light on in this project. So, I mean, and then Conceptually, I connect this kind of light to a spiritual light, which is also could be connected to a, to this bio illuminescence, or if I'm correct, light, which is like happening in the nature already. So I was thinking like this light could be something like metaphorically a spiritual light. And then I must start creating some like objects with clay, which is like this one is representing this object. And I fill them with, with wine and then I start like doing some interaction based on the electricity that generated by wine. And yeah, I mean, that's the like, 
that's the last slide. <laughs> and, okay. I'm really sorry if I take like longer time and then yeah, don't worry, with his heart, like we, we could spend ten hours. With <laughs> thank you. Aren't we? Yeah, and yeah, thank you so thank much. You I'm sorry much. <laughs> for this. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Mohsen. So this is uh, the ideal Pechakcha icebreaker. <laughs> we are missing just one thing, the wine. Did you bring any wine for us? By Mozilla, I guess. <laughs> so wine will be at the end. Thanks, Mohsen. And uh, Mohsen uh, has another pressure. He's taking a bus in uh, yeah, two I'd, hours, and he's going nine. to spend, again, Nine hours in a bus and code something for 12. another performance. <laughs> Twelve, 12 hours. Yeah. So he's going back to uh, to Berlin. Yeah, actually. At nine p.m. Yeah. <laughs> and that's one of the reasons why he did the opening. Yeah. I would have him <coughs> like to do the closing. <laughs> but yeah. thanks, Mosen. And thank you. Again, thank, thank you. you to him. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Are you going to spend a few minutes with us? Of course, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Super. So give me three seconds for uh, changing the... So here we are. As I said, we had uh, speaker number zero. Mohsen was uh, just uh, showing us one way to navigating in complex stories. And here we are coming back with uh, one format, very simple. 20 images, 20 seconds per image, 400 seconds. And as I was telling to Mohsen, the reason why Pechakcha was born is we hate PowerPoint. <laughs> and here this guy was coming us with a PowerPoint skill. So that's reason number one. Reason number two, I know that there are some architects in the room, so don't take it badly. But if you give the floor to an architect, he takes all your evening. And so Pechakcha in Tokyo decided, two architects decided to say, OK, we will give 400 seconds per speaker and we'll have 10, 12 speakers. And then we will have 10, 12 stories. And that was in 2003. And today we are in 2023 and we have more than 1,300 cities doing Pechakcha Nights, where you have about 10, 12 speakers sharing their stories, diversity, themes or non-themes. And today, tonight we have some speakers connected to CPDP, and many speakers coming from different parts of our world. So we will navigate 400 seconds by 400 seconds in different types of universe. As I mentioned, Pechakcha is celebrating 20 years now. And we, on 20th of February each year, there is a kind of event where 120, 200 cities try to do a pechacha at the same time, and for 24 hours, stories are running. Tonight, we will have nine speakers, and each of them will have 400 seconds. And we'll begin with Rebecca. Rebecca is partly connected to the conference, partly. Rebecca is going to uh, highlight some elements that is in resonance with the pain you went through for coming to this place. Maps. And that's one of the reasons why Rebecca is the first speaker. Because she's going to talk about maps. Speaker, keep in mind that you don't have to do next. And you don't have to tell me to do next. Everything will be running smoothly. For the tech team, the ideal positioning of the speaker is there. So I'm the only one who will be jumping. When you are ready, we can shoot. 
this is a kind of non-interactive moment for the speaker, so just get into immersive moment of these fascinating stories and universes. And remember, all of us, we are then going to have some drinks after, and then we can interact with each of the speaker and connect. Are we ready? Yes. OK. I think I, this mic works, right? Yeah. Welcome, Rebecca. Thank you. So we had Mawson, and now we'll have another style. Rebecca, the floor is yours. Hi, um, so I was gonna say my name's Rebecca, but you know that already. Um, I'm here to talk our pro uh, about our project on the exactitude of maps that I'm doing together with um, my teammate Felipe in the context of the code program. And um, the project is about the confluence of uh, cities, labor, data um, in a digital economy uh, through the lens of digital maps. So if you think about how you got here today, probably a digital map was involved somewhere. And our project hinges on the fact that maps are not only informative creatures, so things representing reality, but also things that create reality. Um, they're also productive creatures. To introduce a bit who we are, uh, my name is Rebecca. I'm a, I'm a designer. I'm from Germany, and I'm based in Brussels now. And I'm doing this project together with Felipe Schmidt Fonseca, who's a, a Brazilian activist who's now a, a researcher and PhD candidate. And he lives in Berlin. And um, yes, so I'm talking at, a, at this conference uh, about data and data privacy. So you probably all know that when you use digital maps, the thing that happens on the surface is not all that happens. But there's a lot of data collection uh, going on in the background and a lot of kind of surveillance capitalist interests um, that are happening behind the scenes. And um, when we look at this, it's important to understand that the business model of these map providers um, use user data and sell it uh, uh, as the data itself or as prediction products um, for profit, which means that all users are, are this kind of weird unacknowledged workforce um, um, that contribute to the wealth of big data, often not even knowing how. And um, even Shoshana Zupov, uh, um, a scholar in this field, singles out maps because, uh, and she quotes John B. Harley, a cartographer here, uh, maps create empire. For this project, we're rephrasing this a little bit and saying, OK, maps don't only represent reality, they also create it. And we see this in different functions that maps take. Um, so there's one important function, which means, uh, or which is um, assigning physical places with social capital and social value. So if you're not on the map, you don't exist. Um, in the same way, uh, um, maps inform the decisions that we take. Um, where to go, what to do, uh, uh, where to shop. And this, of course, is a very lucrative place to be involved in for companies acting in a surveillance capitalist society um, because everything, every behavior, every decision that's unpredictable is, a, uh, is lost revenue, essentially, as Shoshana Zupav also says. So maps are very much involved in uh, how our cities evolve. Um, because there's, of course, this ripple effect on urban development, corporate strategies, and also the transformation of all neighborhoods. And it all happens kind of one small, barely noticeable, uh, barely noticeably influenced decision at a time. It was important to mention at this point that there's also a lot of historical precedent in maps being used to kind of put political and economic agendas onto physical spaces. Um, and a lot of this research is, doing, uh, is being done um, kind of looking at colonial histories and the tool of maps that was used there. So when Philippe and I embarked on this project, we needed to find a, a kind of a starting point, and we settled on um, Google reviews and kind of this whole recommendation system that's used in Google Maps. And we thought it was an interesting point because, in a sense, there's data collection happening here in plain sight. Um, reviewers are asked to say what they like and what they don't like, which is very lucrative information if your business model is based on predicting user behavior. Um, but of course, reviewers are not, uh, not part of the profit in that sense. Um, reviewing is seen as this kind of service towards um, um, fellow travelers um, and this thing. So um, yeah, and also, of course, recommendations are a very direct way to kind of influence user behavior. It's also important to us to root our project in a specific urban context. So we're looking at Berlin, Warschau Straße, close to this metro station, which is very 
kind of, a, in a sense, an epitome of what Berlin is for us. So it's very grungy, it's kind of dirty, but it's also a place of rapid transformation where this idea of the authentic Berlin is bringing in a lot of um, kind of investors and um, kind of different developers and is making it more um, expensive for people that have been living there for a long time. Uh, um, so gentrification is essentially at full swing. It was, we wanted to create a situated experience as part of our project. So we decided to kind of use the city in a, in a format of an audio walk. And uh, so we, that we could point to these places of real life transformation and use the city as a metaphor as well. So we decided to synthesize Google ratings together with excerpts from our research into a soundscape that kind of visitors can walk through. And for this, we connected specific locations with specific topics. So in the photo booth that's next to the tram station, for example, we talk about specific user profiling or um, when there's lots of reviews about a club of people not being able to get in, we talk about how um, kind of this kind of data ownership and accessibility issues. Of course, not everyone can go to Berlin, so we're also developing a kind of scale model of this area that we can take to different exhibitions. And the idea is that um, visitors can kind of move these game figures around on this map and also trigger the audio. This scale model plays into our uh, um, kind of criticism in this project because it already brings to mind these kind of games and this context of simulation and manipulation that's going on using digital maps. Um, yeah, so there's a few players uh, that influence uh, what's happening on the board um, according to their interests and fantasies. Um, yeah, so in this way, this project aims to ignite more critical approaches to digital maps and ask these questions of whose agendas are reflected in those and um, uh, how they mediate uh, our experience of the urban environment. And that's it. Thank you so much for your attention. Um, um, you can find our contacts on this slide or uh, reach us through the code program. Someone will also explain what it is, I think Leon, uh, and that will give you better context of where these projects are coming from. Um, so thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. So Rebecca gave us the uh, feeling of Huarzo Pechacha. 400 seconds. Did you enjoy? <laughs> Mohsen is uh, laughing. He's dead laughing. Thanks, Rebecca, for uh, jumping into this first Pechacha. And then we'll move into another universe. Audience, is it okay sound-wise? Otherwise, let us know. Uh, for speakers, there is a screen there if you want to check the visuals so you don't have to break your neck by looking back. Okay. And uh, we'll jump into story number two. And story number two will bring you in complete another scape, especially in terms of granularity, if I may say and we'll jump into signs and symbols with uh, Jo de Bardemacher. Jo, the floor will be yours. Jo is based in Antwerp, but he has been uh, working in different parts of the planet, and uh, his area of uh, activity is typography. And from typography, he will bring us into some fascinating scapes. Yep. All right, yes. Um, good evening, everyone, and thank you very much, Alok and the organizers of Pecha Kucha for asking me to talk. I'm one of the people who is passionate about letters and uh, typefaces and letter forms. So I'm one of the people who is designing uh, letter forms and scripts and typefaces on an everyday uh, basis. I work uh, for local projects, for instance, like uh, designing custom-made uh, identity typefaces for the Museum of Contemporary Arts in Brussels, wheels that you can see here, but also other projects for uh, creating collaborations and uh, creating a visual identity so people can recognize the brand or the identity for which the communication is being made. One of the larger projects I was able to design was a 27-weight typeface for the Flemish government. Um, but it's not just like the government itself, it's really like the services of um, the, the company of the buses, uh, also uh, Sports, uh, Vlaanderen and others uh, are using the typeface, so it's a wide range. Um, another collaboration was with the city of Antwerp and the city of Bruges. 
Uh, in case of Antwerp, I use the baseline and the skyline of the uh, left bank and the right bank of the city and the influences of the uh, architecture, basically, to see the different shapes um, of uh, the letter forms being used by many people. But I also study uh, or do research in uh, endangered writing systems, uh, endangered writing systems that are disappearing in terms of like slow communities only using it, but also worldwide libraries and archives that are really like getting lost. Um, or typefaces that are only being used like in the shape of lettering, uh, which is really handcrafted lettering, in this case in Bhutan, like the, the script that you see, it's uh, Lanza Ranjana. It's only used like to engrave uh, wooden uh, interiors or sometimes engravings in stones, uh, Mani prayers, uh, manuscripts. So together with local communities, I designed typefaces to enable encoding the literature and also the information of their uh, traditions uh, in terms of uh, fonts, because fonts are digital data. And once something is uh, really set into a typeface, then the text can also be distributed. Another example was in case of uh, the traditional Mongolian script that I'm uh, working on, which is a vertically written uh, writing system. Um, is in collaboration also with um, the president of uh, Mongolia, Ulaanbaatar, um, because for a long time they used Cyrillic instead of their traditional script. Um, and I've been researching like the, the, the ways of uh, how the script involved, uh, was evolved from being printing types into like a digital font format. I did a PhD on Tibetan typography, uh, which focuses on this kind of evolution from the first metal printing type and to the last digital fonts that were done. But it's not just academic research, it's also like practice-based outcomes. So it's really to design new typefaces for the local communities, always in collaboration with people living in the areas. Um, most of the time it's funded, but others it's also, yeah, sometimes it's personally initiated uh, to do so. From those uh, studies and different aspects, I create new typefaces to be used uh, on different levels for different, different scripts. So not only like academic texts or like for newspapers or magazines or editorial work, also for first time readers. On the top right, uh, you can see a typeface designed for Tibetan children. Um, and a recent project that I'm involved in is uh, something that I discovered together with the Royal Library here in Brussels. Uh, at the basement of um, the, uh, the large library, which is at the central station, um, we found uh, a number of wooden boxes. And those wooden boxes, as you can see here on the top left, um, contain material from old uh, matrices and print, print, um, punches to actually create printing types for um, the area of Belgium at the time of the foundation of Belgium in 1830. And those uh, uh, we call it type foundries. It's really kind of a factory. And one of them was uh, positioned next door. Um, is the Van der Borgt one that you can see, one of the specimen books here on the left. Uh, they were completely they disappeared. And in the 20th century, they were uh, taken over by a Dutch company that came here from the Netherlands and founded uh, Etablissement Plantain, the Dansaarstraat. Uh, so only the material that you can see here, like these typefaces for both traditional um, elaborative text, but also very funky and very contemporary type, although the, this is a typeface which is more than 100 years old. You can almost see relating type styles nowadays emerging in different uh, ways. So I'm mapping all those uh, printing types back to the tradition and the books. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think the video is working here, but that's fine. Uh, it was to show that um, I'm not creating replicas because the typefaces need to uh, work on contemporary reading technologies and especially the screen is very important. And the new technology in font design is variable font so that they can really move while you're reading and also enable the user to um, change uh, what they are reading into their own needs. If uh, I wear glasses or if someone is impaired vision, they can actually change uh, the text on the um, devices, whether it's a navigation system or a tablet uh, or uh, something else that they are using to their own needs. So um, the research that I'm doing is not only covering like the history of these forgotten type foundries, but also creating these new typefaces. I think the slide is stuck. I don't know. There is something going wrong. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> well, I can talk a bit longer if you don't mind. 
So it's really to come up with completely new uh, fonts. That is, ah, that's the reason. OK, that's good. So that's actually, um, there will might be like another one at the, at the end as well. So this is actually the, the, the variable, <laughs> yes, indeed. the variable font system that automatically you don't have to do anything as a user, but uh, they can change according to how you move the tablet in a portrait or a landscape format. This is the number of the new typefaces based on Belgian traditions uh, that I've been developing and coming up with. So it's a range of display typefaces for both titles that you can use in advertisements or newspapers or magazines, but also for uh, long text, like we call it body text, so create long paragraphs. These new fonts, uh, these are two uh, families that are already released. One is called Brel, and the other one is called Dani. Uh, Brel, of course, uh, the name which is very familiar, uh, which is a serif typeface for long text. The other one is Dani, which is an honor to Dani Klein, the front woman of uh, Vaya Condias, uh, the group. So I'm also trying to yeah, establish like a new sense of uh, Belgian tradition, um, which was completely forgotten because all texts on typography, they really talk about uh, what happened in the Netherlands, of Western Europe, I have to say, in the Netherlands, in Germany, France, and uh, for instance, the UK. But really, the Belgian chapter is completely forgotten until now. But on a lighter note, um, I also do more um, lighter and fun things as well. I mean, the rest is also fun. But I also give, uh, for instance, uh, type walks, uh, which talk about, which I, I do guided walks in cities like Brussels or Antwerp or Ghent and Ostende. And I'll cover, and you can also click the, <laughs> it's just a, a, a quick video, um, like the public lettering, which you can see on the street, but on, I only um, cover like uh, the traditional letter, which still remains to be seen. And I talk about who created it, what year it was on, which architects or craftsmen were involved, and the stories about uh, why it is preserved or not. So if you're interested in joining a type walk or finding out more about the different projects that I'm involved in, please visit either Tipoyo or Typojo is my Instagram account. Studio Type is the one, uh, is a website, or you can indeed uh, scan the QR code to investigate a little bit more about all these different, um, I find interesting um, type design projects um, for you guys. Thank you very much for listening. And Thank you. He, he's the only one who sent me a file where I didn't realize there was some video hidden. <laughs> Thank you, you. We were in conversations for the last five, six years, trying to have you as a Spechakcha speaker, and I'm super happy that you came today and shared your universe. So rich, so diverse. Thanks, you, and you must follow what he's doing because it will bring you in different scapes. So you see that with uh, one poet, one digital artist, a hacker, whatever, a typo, <laughs> video, we are traveling into so different universes. Thank you, ladies, ladies and gentlemen. We are con going to continue now with uh, everybody knows what is 3D, or everybody thinks that she or he knows what is 3D. And today we are having a speaker coming from Paris. She came just two hours ago. She also traveled like hell. Kind of Mosen type of traveling, so thanks Marine for being here. And she's going to share with us her journey intersecting 3D with food. Marine, are you ready? Yeah. Okay. Sure. Audience, are you ready? Audience, are you ready? <laughs> Welcome, Marine. Thank you. So, Marine, hi, everyone. Yep, j'y yep, vais. Sure. As you can hear, I'm French, so I'm passionate about food. <laughs> I'm so passionate that I, I can spend 14 hours in my kitchen to create a dessert. I'm so passionate that I own more than 3,000 cooking books. It's a lot of weight of in my flat, for sure. I read them as you read newspaper. And I'm so passionate that I decided to make a job of it. I've been working in the 3D printing industry since 2011. I created a successful startup, and after 10 years, my partner was so tired that we sold it to BI Self. But I was not done with this technology, and I decided to channel my expertise into my patient, Pastry. I love to work with my hands. 
You know this feeling when your body and your mind are fully aligned. How can technology serve that? So at the age of 44, I decided to go back to school and to become a pastry worker. I had the chance to work with a very famous French chef, Mr. Cédric Grolet. It was far more harder than launching a startup, I can tell you, but I've learned a lot. I have learned that I need to find a technology that will, make, that will be able to design any kind of cookie without any additives. I learned that you have to build an autonomous device that the chef can only control with the smartphones. And I learned that I had to automate tasks to give them more time to be creative. So four years ago, I launched La Pâtisserie Numérique, the digital pâtisserie. And it was for gastronomy business, right? And indirectly, it was also to invent new form of dessert, catering the most creative chefs. Something that is not such a new idea when you think about it. When you consider the architectural sweet wonders that Escoffier and the students, his students met during the 19th century, and you will see them right now. Okay, I'm a little bit too fast. What's great about France is that cuisine is taken very seriously, and it has been for a long time. When you think about it, cooking is really a perfect blend between heart and exquisite chemistry. And I can tell you, printing carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids, lipids is far more challenging than printing titanium or metal alloy. I often say that I do deep take for cakes now. So the first two years, I invested all my money in prototyping all the additive manufacturing technology I knew until I found the right one. The one that will respect the first rule that you learn in kitchen, the rule of the free B in French, so let's say the free G. Your product has to be good, good, and good. <laughs> it's not a well-known technology, and it has been in the public domain, so the path was wide open for me. Two mo 12 months later, we are 10 at La Pâtisserie Numérique, and we have raised money, and we have the support of the public bank. Nine, we took more nine months, to develop an industrial version of a 3D printer. It's called Patis Free. Sorry for the bad joke. <laughs> the first units are deployed in France and here in Brussels, thanks to one of our earliest fans. Allow me now to explain why I love tech. I'm not an engineer by training. I hold a business degree and a pastry degree. But what I love with tech and innovation is that it can disrupt and challenge existing systems habits, how we will produce what we will hit in the coming years. When you have a 3D printer like ours in a bakery or a restaurant, it enables the chef to produce 100% locally at a fair price. Additive manufacturing is really the opposite of a centralized production. It's the opposite of one factory in China feeding all the planet. And if you think it doesn't exist for cookie, it does. It really does. It's also bridging the gap between digital tools and traditional know-how, bringing them together, branching against each other for an explosive blend. And I love that. It goes beyond opposite stances, embracing diversity. This allows us to bring together designers and creators around pastry, starting from a different point than the one used by, traditionally by chefs. For those who are not familiar with knife or mandolin and are more familiar with a computer and a mouse, we are uh, proposing a new gateway. How do you design food? How do you draw food? My love for sweetness doesn't exclude logic. Well, making a machine for local business means making a machine right next to you. So we are producing in Normandy, France, and we are producing manufacturing uh, devices and consumables. We want to build a bigger factory. It's a project with, for 10 million euros and over 75 jobs. But this can only work if we invent delicious, incredibly enticing products, new flavors and textures that are so yummy that you want to devour that every day. And I'm not mistaken about this. I know that's the first condition for the success. So my passion and my ambition now leads me of creating a device that will bring more moments and bring you more smiles, just like Eleonore you will see in the next picture. And you see, you never really know where life bias will lead you. 
today they have led me to envision a new way of creating together, inviting new public, new audience to invent what we will share later on. Because from the beginning of way of preparing what we eat has never been, has always been something truly special, never something normal. We don't eat just to nourish ourselves. But as Chef Thierry Marx says, cooking is giving memory to the ephemeral. And in my modest world, I would say, cooking nourish our bank of memories. So I won't lie to you, my days are long and uh, failure can be bitter. But imperfect as I am, I charge ahead. Because this journey is incredible and look, it has brought me to you today. From the bottom of my, of my heart, I thank you for sharing this moment with me and I wish you happy cooking. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. And I was lucky enough to taste one off. <laughs> so if you want to taste one with Marine, we are busy cooking, brainstorming for something to happen in October. So keep in touch. And let's see if you can, after enjoying the narrative, you need to enjoy the real stuff. So three pechacha navigating, typo and stories, food, are in fact three of my pet zones. So one of the reasons why you are here is because I want to hear fascinating stories. So thank you, speakers. And now we'll move into the next Pechakcha. And this will be by Leon, who was already pre-announced by Rebecca. And Leon, you have 400 seconds to bring us to some places where people don't even imagine. Leon, are you ready to show and tell? Now keep in mind that this guy sends me a mail at 1 a.m. <laughs> telling, can I hack the system and give my talk? I say no. And then a few minutes after, we found a way, and here he is. Leon, welcome, and you have 400 seconds. Welcome, Leon. The floor is yours. Hello, everyone. So uh, I'm going to be talking a bit about nudge dating, which is an art project that I present here at CPDP. Um, it's basically a project that uh, yeah, it's a dating app, and it matches people based on how they typically respond to user interfaces that are used in websites. So you can find your perfect pointer partner. Um, I'm Leon van Oldenborg, and I've been working as a media artist over the last uh, year or so. Um, and I come from a background in game design. And for this uh, yeah, presentation, I'm going to walk you a bit through the process of how we made nudge dating and how I use this expertise in game design uh, yeah, to leverage critical thinking. So when I talk to people that I give design games, this is sort of what they imagined. <laughs> it's like these beautiful, big productions with uh, beautiful visuals and an exciting story to follow. But I mean, for me, this is not what uh, games are all about. Uh, you can also find this in a movie, for instance. So one game that I really, really like is uh, Bounden by Adrian de Jong. Because the games for me are uh, yeah, a system of rules that you ask a player to navigate. And in this way, by just having two simple rules, people need to hold the phone and use the gyroscope, he was able to make people perform some sort of dance to play the game. Uh, so this is some of my earlier work. Um, and this is yeah, kind of what my games typically look like. So I uh, draw parallels to systems that we find in the real world, world to uh, let people experiment with uh, their decision making in the game so they can think about how they do the same kind of decision making outside of the game. Um, and niche dating we made for the code project, which is a co-creation project set up by Impact and uh, Privacy Salon and some others. <laughs> um, and it brings really together like non-artists and artists to work together uh, to reclaim digital agency, um, which I found really, really interesting. Because how do you make something like the GDPR in a way something that you like to talk about. Uh, the question is, how do you make it sexy? Um, which is why we made a dating app, of course. Um, because 
I mean, the conversations around privacy, they usually don't really, they're not that fun, um, which leads to people that are not really, where they sort of know that it's important, but they don't really act on it. And for me, what I'd like to see is a world where people are like at least a little, little bit critical and sometimes take the step to go uh, push that button to actually make the decision, does this suit for me? Um, so the topic that we're exploring is the interface design uh, topic and especially the live interface design. So the evolution of interfaces while you're using them. Um, and this is sort of the iterative cycle for that. Um, and it's really based on gathering a lot of user data and recording all uh, user input to see how people use these kind of interfaces. Um, specifically within the GDPR, something that is specified is that it's really focusing on personally identifiable data. But what we find interesting is that this always evolves. Like this picture of a human iris 100 years ago wasn't personally identifiable, but it is now. Um, so the way they uh, get all this data on how they use interfaces to inform the next it, uh, interface cycle um, is almost always through third party programs that are deployed on websites. And one issue with this is that the privacy statements usually link to each other, which ends up really not telling anything <laughs> at all. Um, and now with that we have the topic to talk about, we need to think about how can we make the player um, make this type of decisions that touch on all these points uh, so they can create their own uh, stance on these topics. Um, so first of all, what we'd really like uh, to have is that the people know what type of data is being collected. So every click is being collected, every mouse movement, every time you scroll, and every keyboard press. So also things that you type in the search bar and then delete later on, later on people can still see and draw conclusions out of that. Then, of course, we want to show that it's really easy to collect this data because it's sort of on the foundational level of the technology that you use. So because you're already using this type of data to, inter uh, yeah, to interact with the interface, it's really easy to then also send this data to a data center to later analyze. And then finally, we would like people to experience um, how this type of data is being used and how, what kind of conclusions are being drawn from it. So we want people to step into the shoes of these uh, user experience uh, designers. And now we go to the, um, yeah, uh, the last thing um, is that we really want to keep the conversation going. So uh, we want to create a really memorable and really fun experience that people outside of conferences like this will still talk about and see what their, uh, their opinions of their friends are and things like that. <laughs> so this is really why we ended up with the dating app format because it uh, sort of goes through all these things very well. Um, I mean, the dating app uh, itself is already very closely connected to uh, issues of privacy. I mean, what kind of relationship do we need to build with people for sharing information? Um, another thing that it does is that it gives us a reason to sort of open up the black box on how we gather the data. Because every app, I mean, there's so many dating apps and all of them need this unique twist that you need to explain in detail and users are also very motivated to read. Um, so that also helps with the understanding. And most importantly, uh, at the selection part, so you can only see how the other user has used the website. So we really ask people to distill the kind of information that they need out of a potential dating partner from just looking at a cursor moving around. So we sort of place the uh, people in the position of this UX researcher making these very personal conclusions. So yeah, we're at the booth uh, tomorrow as well. So come find out what type of clicker you are or what type of scroller you are. And maybe you'll find your next partner. <laughs> Who knows? Thank you, Leon. And if you want to know more about this, uh, after the Pechaccia, there is the drink where you can have more insights provided by Leon. Thank you. Are you OK, audience? Yes. We have some more stories to go. You see the diversity of uh, journeys we are getting into. And the next one will be with uh, Lisa. So Lisa is based here, partly. 
but partly somewhere else. And she's going to share her narrative and share how she's uh, bringing many, many people in some specific journeys. Lisa, are you ready? Sure. Yep. Good. So um, this evening, I want to uh, grab all of your hands, and I want you to come with me on a journey um, onto the sports fields in India to introduce um, the Sports for Life program that I work in with the Nandi Foundation. So we work with women in girls in sports in India. So just to talk, to start about the girls in our program, so we work with 180,000 girls um, in India. Um, their ages are as young as six, and they go up to uh, 15 years old. These girls are part of an after-school education program that's been running for two decades. And in 2019, we added a sports component to this program. So it's grown side by side with the education program. So this program is driven by these wonderful women. Um, we call them our sports allies. And there's actually 6,500 of them that work with our girls in sports. What's really fascinating um, is that these women come from the exact same villages as the girls in our program. So they know the girls so well. They know the girls' family. Um, they know the community. They know the schools that they go to. And they obviously know all of their daily challenges and everything that, that their life is on a daily basis. This map gives you an idea of where our programs are um, in India. For anybody who's been that there, you know that the country is, a very, is very diverse. So we're in nine different states, um, and the girls that are part of our program um, come, we speak, they speak nine different languages, um, they, they have many different religions. Um, their, their food is very different, where they eat, what they eat in different parts of India. And they visually look different as well. So these girls here enjoying their lunch at one of our events um, is, uh, are up from Darjeeling, India. So talking about sports, I wanted to talk a little bit about the sports that we do with the girls. So one of our big programs is athletics. So we do athletics events with our girls. Um, and there we really focus on uh, for fundamentals of sports, fundamental movement. So we endeavor to teach the girls about endurance, um, about speed, uh, about strength and agility. So that is one of the, the big um, kind of foundations of our sports program. And again, what's very special um, about what we do is that the whole program is run by women. So if you would step onto this field and you would see this event going on, you will see that everything is run by our, our sports allies, from the results of the events, to measuring, to timing, um, to officiating, everything is done by these women. We also uh, introduce a team sport. We think that you know you gain many other different characteristics when you play team sports as opposed to individual sports. And so we started a football program as well with our girls and our women. Um, we have, they practice twice a week. They have their game days on Saturday and Sundays. And then um, we also have big, large football tournaments for them. But what we really have have learned over the last five years, and one of the most kind of brilliant aha moments for me is that, again, these women who come from the same villages as these girls are really interested in developing more in sports. Okay, they really feel like they didn't have the opportunity as a kid to learn about sports, and they really want the opportunity now. So we've invested a lot of energy and time and resources into training these women to be sports coaches. So we're really proud of this program. We have the women you see in this picture who have um, finished their certification with the All Indian 
Football Federation. These women are all from rural, rural India, where you don't see um, girls and women engaged in sports. But if we talk about a sports for life, it's much, much more than the technical aspects of sports that we want to afford these girls and these women. So we also want them to have an ownership over their physical body, to really understand their body in order to own it. So we do a lot of nutrition awareness in our program. So from things like every event that we host where the girls come to, we make sure that the food is very healthy, that they're eating and that they have access to at our events. Um, we also have awareness where we teach them about uh, hydration, the importance of drinking a lot of water, which might sound very logical to us, but is not part of the culture there for many reasons. So we talk to them also about hydration. We also want them to learn about their physical self, you know, as girls change, as they go from six-year-olds and they grow um, up to be 15, there's a lot of changes that a girl will go through and we want them to understand that. We want them to understand that physical activity and physical fitness can, can make their body strong. And of course, a very huge part of that learning about your physical body is also menstruation awareness. So many of these girls, in, they go to state schools in India, there's no, there's no health unit that they, they, they learn from. So this is all part of our Sports for Life program. So I want to thank you. I want to thank you for coming with me um, in these short 400 seconds to India on the field to see our girls and women. And, and I invite all of you one day maybe to come in person and come visit our program. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. And uh, if you want to talk with Lisa later, after the Pechakcha, she'll share with you some of the stories. So after Lisa, we are going to um, jump back to Brussels, in a way, with an architect, Arthur. So in my intro, I was telling that if you give the floor to an architect, he takes all your evening. Here we have an architect, and he will have only 400 seconds. But he'll share with you some fascinating stories of shaping some stuff, if I may use that. Because what you'll see here is a journey where many of you, especially with what happened some two, three years ago, will see that there are fascinating connections. Arthur, ready? Yep, welcome Arthur. <coughs> Hi, everyone. So tonight, I'm going to talk to you about uh, something that concerns many of working people. Uh, it's remote working. And more precisely, I'm going to talk about uh, garden office and our solution that, it, that can uh, um, give, you, give you a better work-life balance. So we all know, we all know about uh, flexible office space, how office are changing uh, after COVID, and also new uh, concept as co-meeting venues mm -hmm. to change the organization of office. But there is also another pro problem that we know is how to manage the work-life balance at home when you are uh, with the children at home uh, while working, or also the couple uh, work balance when you are both working at home with your partner. So uh, we thought about a solution and um, we found a way to, to manage it with a garden studio. So it's a little construction made of wood, 100% wood, and uh, all prefabricated that we can put in one day in a garden without a permit needed. So before talking too much about the solution, I, I will introduce a bit the journey and uh, the story of it. So I'm uh, an architect, uh, engineer architect, um, and I was based in uh, Switzerland for, for the last 10 years. And I had the opportunity to, to discover the um, modular construction of uh, sheds and uh, mountain uh, uh, refuge uh, and all the grain store, and that inspired me. Um, so during COVID, I spent my three first months uh, working from home. So I had the opportunity so to, uh, to dream about um, modular uh, utopia. And uh, so 
because I love to um, construct modular furniture, I thought about uh, a solution uh, to give more space for people, more room uh, during COVID to, um, to, for, for themselves. So I uh, met engineers uh, that had the super machine, which is a, a CNC that could transform uh, wood panels in a piece of construction, piece of furniture. So I decided to um, build a first prototype in Geneva, in a friend's garden, uh, to, uh, to try it. And uh, so my friend was uh, a really good beta tester, and his kid was uh, my first fan because he loved this shed uh, in his garden. And um, at this point, uh, yeah, the, one of the, the aim was to do um, a space where you can optimize uh, everything uh, as boats or tiny houses, but with a circular way um, so that we could uh, put and remove all the furniture to make it evolve uh, in time and uh, to, to replace it. I, I put some pictures on Instagram and my Belgian friends told me, okay, I want this in my garden, it's super cool. So we dismantled it and we brought it in Brussels. And uh, I had some problems uh, at the custom because uh, the, the truck was too heavy, but uh, we, we managed to rebuild it. And um, so I found a craftsman that accept to, uh, to build, uh, to, to give me a good offer to build three more wood caps. And I, s I sell it to my first client. And I, I, I managed to bring it to a fair before so that I could show it to most people possible before bringing it to my first client. So this was the result of the first uh, installation in Brussels. And it's all we see that Brussels is a really good city because we've got lots of two-phase houses with little gardens. And this construction without permit is a real opportunity to bring more room uh, for work at home. So we are really happy. Uh, and we, we used crane to put it in the garden because uh, it, it, was, it was really more efficient. But it was too heavy, and uh, we had to remove the window to put it in the garden. So this was really not easy, but we managed it. And he was happy, so um, we developed the product. And so this is it, uh, a wood construction, really simple with the wood insulation, uh, removable screw for foundation, and even a climatizer with a, a heat pump so that it's more ecological uh, possible with a, a green roof. So I uh, found two uh, co-founder, uh, one for selling the product and one for uh, getting finance uh, and raise money. So now we are three of us and uh, 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 another, uh, another people uh, just joined the team. And uh, we are really happy with the product. So we did different sizes from six square meters to 20 square meters from 20 to 40,000 euro. And um, so all with the, you can always choose where you put the windows and where you put the modules because it's all modular. So with the same modules, you can do an infinite uh, solution. So for us, what's important, it's innovation. Don't keep staying lean in a startup way. Uh, so the next step will be to find um, a way to go back to the um, modular situation that you can construct with your end, so find a way to uh, assemble things uh, in a good way. So staying sustainable for sure. So we, uh, as I said, the modular system make it possible to uh, build it and to unfold it and to rebuild it uh, in another, another way. Uh, so we can go further in this direction and uh, uh, get better um, stuff. Uh, materials. So our clients are two types of clients. So the one who's really urban uh, and the one who's much more peri-urban and who sometimes it's a bit wealthier. So he, he would be, he would take it for artistic use. Um, so this is where we are. Uh, this is our Instagram page and we are now uh, putting wood caps a bit everywhere in, uh, in Belgium and even in France. And we are raising money to continue growing in this, uh, in, this, uh, in this way of circularity and, um, and 
this is it. So I also think there is a last point. Uh, it's much more e for... Is he allowed to? With, okay. As I said, it's much it's more for wealthy huh? people because they need to have a garden. But I think it's also a solution for a common interest because if people are working from home, there will be less commuting. And also we could transform building offices building in new uh, living area so that we could have more mixity in urbanism. So it's a common interest. Thank you, Arthur. Merci, Arthur. I was telling an architect takes always some more time. <laughs> the proof is in the pudding. <laughs> Thank you, Arthur. And you see that we have been traveling in different parts and we'll go back now to food. But food with a twist, if I may. Audience, are you okay? Yep, I hear some stomachs beginning to crumble, but uh, there might be some drink and food, I hope. Tabea, are you here? No? Tabea is somewhere. I would like to thank the technical team in the back there, ensuring that we have a smooth moment. And all the logistics behind, which is coordinated by Tabea. So I hope that you'll have a chance to meet Tabea and then Mohsen, are you still okay? Yeah, like five minutes. Five minutes, okay. I see. Otherwise, uh, Arthur can provide you a place to stay. <laughs> Mathilde. Let's welcome Mathilde, who's uh, into food world. But as I said, food with a twist, if I may. Mathilde, are you ready? Yes. Yep. So good evening, everyone. Today I'm going to talk to you about food innovation and more specifically about alternative proteins and how is it regulated, uh, legally speaking. And food innovation is a very fascinating topic, but it can also be frightening to, um, regarding like, what kind of application we can uh, uh, have for a specific technique. So my name is Mathilde Doshi. I'm uh, French, but I'm of uh, foreign descent. And uh, shocker, I'm also very much into food. Uh, and uh, I grew up uh, within a multicultural uh, household, but I, I grew up um, monolingual. And what was transmitted by my family was the love of food and how is it viewed uh, across the world. I have family scattered like literally everywhere. And very young, I was um, conscious that food is very much, um, it's a local, it's a global topic, but it's regulated uh, at the local topic. So at the local level, in the sense that uh, you have consideration to, uh, to consider. And our food system is uh, actually broken um, in the sense that the way we are producing protein at the moment is uh, not so sustainable. For instance, cow. 90% um, of what a cow uh, is producing is waste, um, mostly methane. And this is when uh, alternative protein come into play. So there are different ways of producing uh, protein. So we have uh, protein sources from plants, from algae, and uh, over uh, non-animal bases, but also from fermentation. So you can have, for instance, milk from uh, fermentation and also from cells. So you may have heard, for instance, uh, a cell-based burger that was uh, commercialized uh, a couple of years ago or unveiled to the public. And how is it uh, regulated at the local uh, level? Very much depend on uh, whom you ask and also where uh, you ask, because you have uh, local elements to um, uh, put an emphasis on, depending on whom you ask. And this is a, an overview of uh, the jurisdictions that are cur currently regulating alternative proteins as a specific category, novel food. And it's a map from uh, NGO called uh, the Good Food Institute. And this is where they are working or where they have uh, offices. So you can see from the far east to the far west. Uh, and so Europe, uh, in Europe, we have a novel food list. So it means that a food that is uh, from um, a made like in an innovative way can only be commercialized if it's listed on the list. And as soon as you get approval from the European Commission, you can sell it in the 27 member states and also other places like uh, Switzerland. And uh, on the other side, uh, in the US, you don't necessarily need to ask for approval. You can actually put uh, a food uh, product that is issued for, from uh, um, innovative technology on the market without asking the FDA except for something uh, specific that is uh, cell-based meat, where you need to ask uh, for regulatory assessment. 
And on the other, other hand, uh, Canada has a non, non um, novel food list in the sense that food is only authorized if it's listed as a non novel um, food. And so instead of having something that requires a long uh, regulatory uh, approval process, you need to have it uh, there. And uh, Singapore is like one of the front runners uh, of the movement as they were the very first country to authorize a cell based meat burger back in 2020. And it's also because of uh, food sec security consideration as the country imports up to 90% of their food and they need to find other ways of uh, uh, feeding their population. And Israel is also one of the hotspots in terms of food innovation. They have um, many companies that are working on delivering uh, protein through um, alternative uh, sources. So for instance, uh, cell-based milk that was recently uh, authorized in um, Israel from a company called Remilk. And their neighbors, uh, the Gulf region, they have a system like the EU, where you get, as soon as you get regulatory approval in one of the member states, you can also apply for mutual recognition in another one. So it's a good market also to consider. And it's also um, a market that is putting a lot of money um, as they are a food insecure uh, region. And you can see that all these uh, differences also impact uh, international trades in the sense that a company that is operating globally, we have to double check every time they want to enter a new market because it can be blocked uh, at the custom very uh, easily. So in harbors and also in the airports. And one way to raise awareness about the whole topic is mm -hmm. the advocacy. So we have to rethink uh, as consumers, but also our policymaker, the way we um, see uh, what a food can be in the sense that uh, uh, most of the time we don't really question where our food uh, is from and how it was produced and also the environmental impact. In order to do this, we need to reform our system. So we need to analyze uh, which um, laws are working and uh, which uh, needs to be uh, re uh, rewritten because there is always a way to um, design the system more uh, efficiently. And one of the key, um, key hot topic in this is like the labeling aspects. Uh, you may have heard like a couple of years ago, the EU was uh, having a, a very intense debate about whether or not you can label plant-based uh, meat as meat. So for instance, a burger, and this is a campaign from uh, NGO involved uh, in the meat lobbying. And the way we see f uh, food is also related to food psychology, depending on where you were uh, born and raised and also where you travel to, uh, you may not have the same definition of food. For instance, uh, insects, they are widely consumed in certain parts of the world, but it would be not so appealing in other ones. And uh, for this, we need to also raise awareness and companies they need to talk directly to consumer. This is the very first prototype of uh, a cell-based meat burger from the Netherlands that was unveiled to the public uh, 10 years ago. Uh, in Maastricht. And this is Mark Prost, that is the cardiologist uh, that uh, developed uh, this product. And the way that uh, we see food is also um, uh, a collective um, action in the sense that what you had uh, for dinner uh, is not only a personal choice, but has also uh, environmental impacts. And we need to also be kind and uh, have a step-by-step -step approach to change our way of eating. Thank you. Thank you, my team. Okay. In fact, Mohsen was waiting for his computer. Sorry. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, you need uh, any help? No, no I'll find this quickly. Okay. <laughs> I was wondering why is he not leaving? But he was waiting for his computer. <laughs> so, thank you again, Mohsen, and uh, wishing you a yeah. bon voyage. Thank you so much. Audience, are you okay? We still have uh, two Pechakcha to go and they will be done, so be ready to travel. And then we will uh, have uh, hopefully some drink. And I see Tabea is there, so it's time to applaud Tabea, who's been all the coordination. <laughs> Mohsen, we can only wish you a bon voyage. Bon voyage means have a good uh, journey back home. <laughs> yeah. So uh, in Iranian, in Iranian, how do you say? Say what? Tashakur. <laughs> <laughs>
ممنون اوکی تشکر ممنون اوکی بون ویاج سی او And the next speaker will be Giuseppe Atoma. And he will bring us into design worlds. Everybody knows what is a post-it. Everybody maybe has been involved in a kind of uh, so-called design thinking workshop. Maybe yes, maybe not. Okay, For forget about that. And <laughs> Giuseppe is the guy who will shake we'll your mind. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So, okay, we can Ready? Go. Yeah, sure. So my name is Giuseppe Tomapepe. I am uh, actually involved in the design industry for more than 30 years now, which doesn't make any, me any younger, but that's uh, the truth. And uh, well, for the very beginning, actually, I, I say, I, I had this idea to have a kind of avatar, you know, say, so, okay, I'm doing design, but at the same time, I work on understanding what we are doing as designers, okay? And that's something that's very interesting because when you see that with the look of anthropologists, you are surprised, for example, to notice that it's a kind of religion, okay? So is a typically, and in anthropology, we can call it a belief system. And we have this kind, for example, of piece. We, I don't need 20 seconds to comment on this piece of bullshit because actually you can find it, you know, in every design school, you know, sometimes on posted on the wall, you know. And what does it mean? Nothing. But it's interesting about, about this wording, you know, about redemption, to save the world as designers, you know. And on the other end, instead, we find a kind of attempt to build a kind of rationalized system in order to explain our clients, okay, we have to diverge, diverge, converge with these kind of things. But again, we don't have any proof or any piece of evidence that means something. It is a kind of a, a tent can have an impact because in reality as designers, we know that this is kind of a mess. You know, we think that is, we control nothing in, in, instead, you know. So my point is about, you know, uh, well, the slide is stuck or something. I don't, yeah, okay. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's a, that's a, okay. <laughs> it's a kind of trick, you know. You have 20 seconds sometimes. Sometimes are 15. Okay. This is an utter mystery, you know. I say, okay, how how can you, in truth, believe, you know, that just putting pe the people in a room with uh, some post-it, you can deliver something, you know, miraculously, you know. I don't know. It's, a, it's unbelievable. And again, another point to me is that the mystery again is say, okay, we. We, we, we know that we are fought, you know, when we be talking before, you know, another speaker about capitalism and something, you know, we know what the assembly line is, you know, but in fact, you know, when we work as designers, we work for the capitalism, digital capitalism industry, it's exactly the same thing, but instead it's cool, you know, and the, at the end, you know, we believe this is a piece of actually of religious, you know, uh, uh, if, if you know, you've ever seen, um, this commercial, I invite you to look on YouTube, is very impressive about the Apple, okay. And another point, again, as an anthropologist, you say, okay, this is this about belief. And now let's try to focus about what actually people do when they say, okay, we are doing design, okay. So some, some idea here is, okay, first of all, we say, okay, observation, behavior of observation, in truth, that is a very, strong piece of our theory of our methodology. But again, you know, we do that in a very, let's say, superficial way. Let's uh, confess that, okay? So, it, uh, bias a lot because in fact, can die is kind of wishful thinking behind. Another interesting thing is about speculative thinking, you know? We plan as designer, we figure out that we are able to forecast, you know, future words and future solution. But in fact, based on what, we don't know. You know, is it nice, but it doesn't mean nothing to me. Then there's something which is very interesting about, this is an interesting point to me about aesthetics, you know, because actually it's interesting to see how we can try to cross, you know, some kind of a strategic thinking, a kind of pieces of consultancy at the same time to do something nice, you know, and something that relate us with our, let's say, our, our catapult, uh, uh, they say uh, values as a as a, a human species. 
The same, this is a very interesting piece of, uh, let's say, um, of, uh, of uh, art, you know, of, or whatever, or, or design, we can, we can describe it as uh, design as well. And it's about language. And this is another interesting thing because I, a point that the, I'm surprised to notice that designers are not able to, well, don't talk about that that much, you know. And in fact, this is a, a strong value or capability of designers to be able to organize complex systems, you know, which is a physical or virtual spaces. And uh, last point, what next? You know, will design be there forever or we just a given moment like the coal mine industry, you know, be kind of a, they say a crisis of designer, whatever, you know, we have a, and so uh, I think we miss something, you know, we are overlooking something. First to me is to be, uh, let's say, honest about reality, being able to represent reality and not wishful thinking and not the world as we would like to be. You know, and uh, something uh, the same is all the rhetoric about doing a cool thing. You know, so when you type, you know, on the stock image, uh, happy designer, this is what you have. You know, <laughs> and this is about a pop culture thing. You know, it's a gener generational thing. Say, okay, but what about being just, you know, <laughs> self-taught, learn books, whatever. And the last point to me is about being able to express doubt and use doubt as a tool, you know? And because my point is that we are living in a world when we meet a lot of certainty, a lot of assertive thinking, you know? And instead, you know, we should change that, you know? And the risk, if we don't do that, that in the future, there will be not designers doing design, you know? Someone else will do it. You know, we'll do all this set of useful things, but not the designers. So this is actually my point. And if you type, you know, at another point, the last point, you know, is that you type in mid-journey a prompt like this, you have this piece of uh, very, very, very ugly piece of, uh, of something, whatever. And uh, okay, so what do we, we would like to do in the future and what do we want to be? Thank you. Thank you, Giuseppe. The challenge is that with Giuseppe, in fact, we need to have 400 minutes and not 400 seconds because there are so many points that we need to discuss. And so Leon and Rebecca, you must catch uh, Giuseppe after because it was only the tip of the iceberg. And Giuseppe has been active, as he said, in the industry for uh, quite some years. And um, he has had some interesting <laughs> conversations. And here comes the end of our Pechaccia with one more speaker. Anjali, yeah. I hope. <laughs> and Anjali will bring us uh, back into some CPDP uh, resonance with code and stuff like that. Yes. Are you ready? Uh, yes, I'm ready. Yeah. Yes. Welcome Anjali, the last speaker here. <laughs> Uh, I'm very impressed with everyone's presentation so far, so forgive me for relying on my notes. Uh, today I'll be presenting my, or our code project, uh, Voices. Um, and just to get some context, I'm a data scientist interested in digital phenotyping, surveillance and machine learning, oh, and machine listening, so I'm really interested in voices. But why voices? So our voices can reveal many aspects of our identity, emotion, and well-being. Our pitch, our tone, and our residence can reveal our age and our gender. And our accent, our speech patterns, and our language can reflect our regional, ethnic, and cultural heritage. Uh, modulations in voice inflections allow us to express our joy, uh, anger, fear, and sorrow. And with today's AI uh, technologies, we can leverage these distinct vocal qualities to identify individuals, as well as analyze their emotions. And this has widespread implications for voice ownership and privacy. Our voices uh, become, are becoming more and more integral uh, with our digital communications. And there are concerns regarding uh, privacy, consent, and potential misuse of voice data. 
AI technologies such as voice assistants, voice recognition systems, and voice synthesis algorithms have the capacity to analyze, interpret, and even manipulate our voices. AI algorithms that analyze our voices for biometric identification, cultural profiling, or personality profiling, and ethnic de uh, emotion detection may raise questions about the extent of surveillance and the potential for oppression, manipulation, or discrimination. Moreover, the development of AI-driven voice synthesis technologies raises questions about the authenticity and the integrity of our voices in digital spaces. The ability to mimic and replicate human voices can have significant implications for trust, credibility, and the potential for misinformation or malicious activities in digital environments. The utilization of biometric voices and emotion recognitions by public authorities raises concerns about the accuracy, transparency, and potential bias, biases associated with such tech. The improper uh, implementation or misuse of these technologies can result in violations to individuals' rights to privacy, liberty, and the right to a fair trial. So as AI continues to evolve, it is able to uh, it is crucial to ensure the transparency, accountability, and ethical practices in the development and deployment of these systems. Safeguarding user uh, privacy, obtaining informed consent uh, for voice data, and implementing robust uh, security measures are essential for mitigating potential risks. So given that we're at CPDP, it's important to mention that currently the European Parliament is preparing to vote on the landmark uh, AI Act, and, but its members are still negotiating bans and high-risk judgments for real-time biometric identification uh, and analyses and emotion recognition in public spaces. So the ban on relative use of uh, remote biometric identification systems is a right step in the right direction but it doesn't address all the potential uses of these systems. So for example, uh, this means that law enforcement uh, still have the ability to uh, remotely track you with your biometric voice data, uh, even days, uh, sorry, even days or hours or months or years after your data has been collected. And this raises concerns as it enables the potential identification of individuals even uh, such as protesters, whistleblowers, and journalists, and undermining their privacy and potentially infringing on their rights. So this ban, unfortunately, only applies to law enforcement. So consequently, uh, governments, store managers, schools, and various public and private actors are still able to conduct voice surveillance or any type of biometric surveillance in public spaces. And this leaves the general public susceptible to surveillance practices from a wide range of sources, limiting the scope of privacy protection in these environments. Uh, the audio deepfakes, or voice cloning, uh, is a type of AI that's used to uh, create convincing speech sentences that, ooh, I'm a little bit too slow, so I'm going to skip through this. But I just want to emphasize that uh, audio deepfakes or deepfakes in general uh, disproportionately affect, um, well, 90% of deepfakes uh, impact women, which leads to severe violations of privacy, repetition, and emotional well being. Let's see. So for the Voices Project, finally, we're going to create a, a confessional booth that serves as an artistic intervention to explore the possibilities and implications of AI voice technology, particularly focusing on biometric identification and voice cloning. And the project provides a unique immersive experience for audience members to experience this technology firsthand. So in the confession booth, we invite you, the audience members, to tell us your secret and we're going to use your voice to then tell someone else's secret. And so by telling your secret, you also get a secret back. And the other secrets that you hear will also be uh, using voice clones of other audience members that were previously in the booth. Perfect. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Just making sure. Uh, yes, and the act of recording one's voices underscores the potential for misuse or betrayal 
of your intimate information in the digital realm, and it prompts the audience to reflect on the value and sensitivity of your voices as unique identifiers and the need uh, for enhanced measures to pr protect your personal voice data. The, the, ooh, and thank you to our sponsors. Uh, so for the code sponsors, and I want to thank my team, and thank you, Mosin, who is our first presenter who generated the slides for us. So thanks, everyone. Thank you, Anjuri. Thank you, Pechakcha speakers. Thank you, Pechakcha audience. This time, the Pechakcha was a little bit earlier because of some uh, logistical reasons, but usually we begin at 2020 because it's about 20 by 20. And so in few months, if you are interested to be a Pechakcha speaker, you talk to me. We are preparing one in uh, September, October. And uh, now, Tabea, if you are okay, we are allowed to enjoy some uh, networking moments. Follow the uh, MC Tabea and she will show us the way. And thank you to all speakers. Have a good Pechakcha now. Bye-bye.